what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace. This is brought to you by people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again to the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us from His Word. We're going to bring to a conclusion today and in our next study uh, the, the lengthy study that we've been doing together about uh, Through the Bible in Seven Hours, a strategic grasp of the Word of God. And, uh, you know, I, when, when, when we've been doing this, each of our programs are a half hour long, so it's been two programs to make an hour. And we've covered the whole Bible now down we, to this week and next week. We're going to finish out by, by looking at the ages to come, the books of Hebrews through Revelation specifically. And I, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, you can't, you can't get the whole Bible. Uh, and my, my, my goal when I started with that, I told you, wasn't to tell you the stories of the Bible and just give you a, a storyline. There's a ministry that uh, I think it's called Walk Through the Bible, where they'll take you through the storyline of the Bible. I don't just desire to have you get the storyline of the Bible. I want you to have a grasp of how to understand the Bible, how to comprehend the Bible, how to get out of the Word of God the prophet, doctrinal prophet, the reproof correction that God has put in it so that the instruction and righteousness that's found in the Scripture can be yours. And to get a grip on the whole of the Bible so that you can go to the Scripture and study it and understand it for yourself. If you've ever seen one of these puzzles that people put together, you know, the, the, the thousand and ten thousand piece puzzle, uh, you, you know, the, the, the way you put those together is you get the box with the co with, on the cover with the picture of it and put it up, and then you begin to segregate the pieces away, color code them and so forth, until you can kind of get them where they, where they go, and then you begin to work from, the, from the, the big picture down into the small pieces and put the pieces together. Well, if you can get a strategic grasp of the overview of the Word of God and get a grip on that, and then you get the peace. You might not understand the peace. In fact, can I tell you, I've been studying the Bible a long time, and there are lots of pieces that you just don't ever quite finish understanding. But at least you know where they fit in the puzzle. And when you can do that, what that does is it gives you a comprehension of God's Word, and it allows you to, to, to get the peace in the right place, uh, in, the right, in the right sector, and gives you some real possibility of understanding how it fits with everything else. Well, to get that kind of a grip on the Word of God is what dispensational Bible study is all about. It's what rightly dividing the Word of Truth is about. And where we are today, and I'm going to get the chalkboard out now, where we are today is we're going to be studying, we, we've come through the Bible, and we've, we, we've studied our way to the very last section in the Scripture, the Hebrew Epistles, we discovered that the Apostle Paul divides the Bible up into three basic sections. There's, first, there's time, past. Then there's what he calls, but now. And then there's what he calls the, the ages to come. And those three sections, that's just, you know, that's the future, that's the present, and that's the past. That's what a timeline is, and that's what dispensational Bible studies is, just understanding the Bible, laying it out on the timeline. In time past, the basic characteristic is this distinction between the circumcision, which is the nation Israel, and the uncircumcision, that's everybody else, that's what we call the Gentiles. Your Bible's laid out this way. Genesis to the book of Malachi, what we call the Old Testament, uh, is, is in time past. Then you have the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those books present the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to the nation Israel. Jesus Christ dies at the end of these books. He's resurrected. He ascends into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit back on the little flock. In the early Acts period, the book of Acts begins here. And then in the book of Acts, you see the fall of Israel. And the salvation goes to the Gentiles through a new ministry. Christ from heaven reveals to the Apostle Paul a new set of 
instructions and a new ministry. And you have the books of Romans through Philemon that describe what God's doing today in the church, the body of Christ, in this secret, unprophesied, un unexpected program. This ministry back here is prophecy. This is a description of the things which God has accomplished and made known since the world began. When you come over here to Paul, you come to this secret program, that which he kept secret since the world began. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earthly ministry of Christ Israel, book of Acts, salvation, renewed offer, offer of salvation to Israel, their rejection of it, their fall of Israel, salvation going to the Gentiles apart from Israel through a new unprophesied, unexpected ministry revealed by Christ to, to, to Saul, to Paul, the body of Christ. Now this program will end one day. Christ will come back, take the body of Christ back into the heavens to be with him. And when he does that, the program that was interrupted back here, the prophetic program will be brought to a conclusion, a, be brought to fruition in the ages to come. John the Baptist warned him about the wrath to come. Fits right there. Christ talks about his coming, talks about thy, thy kingdom come out here. And the books of Hebrews through Revelation doctrinally fit into the, this area. They fit into this ages to come here. And that, that, that issue of, 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 the, uh, of, of them fitting there and, and working there, that, that gives you the whole of the scripture. And if you can get a grip on where these things fit, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earth of the ministry of Christ, book of Acts, fall of Israel, salvation going to the Gentiles, Romans to Philemon, where we are, Hebrews to Revelation, the ages to come. It's fascinating that just the index of your Bible does that. You see, if you just read your Bible, not books about the Bible, not listening to preachers talk about the Bible, but actually read the Bible. When you actually read the Bible, you'll get the edification that's there, even if you don't know that's what's happening to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how God has put His Word together. Now, if you come with me to the book of John, there's just something marvelous about how God's wisdom has placed these books together where they are, the way they are. In John chapter number 16, verse 12. By the way, in John chapter 14, verse 23 and, 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 and 24 and 25 and 26, the Lord Jesus Christ, the night before he dies in the upper room of the apostles, he preauthorizes the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In chapter 16, he's going to preauthorize the writing of the books of Hebrews to Revelation. He says this, Matthew, John 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. He's in the upper room before he dies. He's talking to them in chapter 14, 15, and 16 about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter and the ministry that the Holy Spirit will have in their life after he goes away. He's going to die, be resurrected, ascend into heaven, and pour out upon them the promise of the Father, the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to give them the capacity to understand some things that back here Christ couldn't tell them. Verse 13, How be it, when the Spirit is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall, he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall show you, you, watch, things to come. So what they're expecting the Spirit of God to do is to give them information about the ages to come. So come with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter... Number two, and notice what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3. How shall we escape? By the way, Hebrews kind of tells you something about who it's written to, okay? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. That's the early Acts period. 
What they're doing in early Acts is the continuation of what Christ taught them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They continue that ministry in early Acts. Now, he said, I got some things to tell you that you can't get now, but you'll get them after the Holy Ghost has come. So he teaches them, then he gives them the Holy Spirit, and it's the, he continues the, this same message. Verse number th five. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. Watch now. Whereof we speak. The writers back here are talking about the world to come over here. You see, God in his wisdom knew that he was going to interrupt this program and that it was going to go on for over 2,000 years. And that when the tribulation came in the last days over here of Israel's program come, they're going to need some scripture that's going to explain to them what's going on, why the delay, and what their program is involved in in light of their advanced revelation given through Paul that isn't back here in, in, in that information. So God, in his wisdom, has some books written down during this period of time that are going to focus on the world to come. How do I know that's what they focus on? I can read Hebrews 2.5 and he tells me. Okay? So these books are going to focus on this ages to come, on the world to come. If you look back at chapter 1 in Hebrews, God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. He began to be spoken by Christ, confirmed us by them that heard him, and then now we're speaking about it. You see, we're talking about the prophetic program, and we're talking about Israel's last days in the prophetic program. So these books over here are going to focus on the last stages of Israel's program in prophecy. And they're going to especially bring to fruition and explain how it's going to be brought to fruition through the little flock. For not little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Come with me to the book of James, chapter number 5. And notice that that's still the focus James chapter number 5. James 5 verse number 7. Be patient therefore brethren under the coming of the Lord. The focus is on his coming. Behold the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Notice the coming of the Lord is being under discussed here is his coming as a judge. To judge and make war. That's, this, that's not this coming. Here he comes to take the church away, the body of Christ out. Here he comes to set the record straight. Here he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance of them that are not God, and obeyed not the gospel, coming as a judge. The focus in these books is here. Take therefore your brethren, verse 10, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an, exam an, an example of suffering affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You see, the issue over here is suffering and enduring unto the end so you can be saved into that kingdom. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. They're studying, somebody's teaching to them the, the book of Job about the righteous, Job suffering under the satanic captivity. And then, in the end, being delivered from satanic captivity, as Israel will be delivered from the Antichrist, into the double blessing, double portion blessing of the kingdom, which God promised Israel in her kingdom. So, James again, 
focusing on the ages to come. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Peter 1, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Here they're looking toward the end and the salvation. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Verse 13 he says, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're talking about his, we've got a book over here called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Come with me if you will to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Chapter number 1. Verse number 10. Wherefore, the, the, the rather brethren, be, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall, no, you, you shall never fail, fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, they're talking about going into, Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born of the of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Talking about getting into that kingdom. Talking about Israel in the last days and the, pro, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the things going on there. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. The, the, the second, this second epistle, beloved, have I, uh, I now write unto you, in, in, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of, our, of, the, of us, the apostles. He's talking about what the prophets spoke, and that was spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets, and by the twelve apostles, by us, the apostles. Knowing this, verse 3, that there should come in the last days scoffers. You see, this ministry back here has to do with the last days of prophecy, and these guys over here are talking about the last days of prophecy. These things fit together. First uh, John, First John chapter two. I, I'm, I'm, I keep holding up the sign, telling me the time's zipping away, and I'm trying to zip through some of this stuff. Uh, but I, I say that to you because you know I get frustrated because there's not enough time to say everything that needs to be said, and I want to say more. So I, I know I talk fast and all that kind of stuff. But uh, if you get the handout, uh, the little book, you'll, you'll see it'll go right along with it. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18. And it'll give you a lot more information than, than I can get over in this, in this study. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time. That's when John's writing. He's writing in the last time. You've heard that the Antichrist shall come. That's the issue in this period right here. The Antichrist. Uh, e e even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That's when it is. Come with me to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, verse number 14. Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these. Enoch, way back yonder, Genesis 5, prophesied of what the, what's happening right over here to Israel in those last days. Saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Right there, Revelation 19. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all the ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Woo! <laughs> you read that and say, whoa! There the judge stands at the door, ready to judge. Verse number 24, Jude 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Right there, the kingdom. So when you come to the book of the Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, he sent and signified it by his angels unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. You see, friend, what's going on here in these books is the, is the ages to come, the world to come whereof we speak. 
And just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present the earthly ministry of Christ to Israel, the book of Acts presents the offer of Israel, the fall of Israel, salvation going to the Gentiles through Paul's ministry. Romans to Philemon present the body of Christ where we are today. Hebrews to Revelation presents the last days of Israel's program through the tribulation into the kingdom, the ages to come. Now when you see that, and you follow that, you begin to see the wisdom of God in putting it together that way. So that now you have God's Word put together in a way that you can grasp it and understand it. One of the things you need to remember when you're over there, the basic characteristic of time past, the distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, is done away with in here where today there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the bond and free. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile in here. In the body of Christ, there is no Jew, no Gentile, Male or female, bond or free, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. But the ground is level in here. We sing that song, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name and a king can do the same. The ground is level. That's not true back here. But that distinction that's true back here, that is done away with here to form the body of Christ, is back in effect over here. That thing back here in Ephesians 2 is called the middle wall of partition, a division. That middle wall is back up over there. Uh, if you go with me to Hebrews chapter number 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, protectors of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that, he, that appointed him, even as Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was appointed, wor accounted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he hath builded the house that hath more honor, uh, he, he that buildeth the house hath more honor than the house. Notice, he's talking about Moses, Israel back here, and the house that God's building through Moses. Now verse 6 he says, But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast... This stuff is, the wall's back up here. Look at James chapter number 1. James chapter 1. Here's a verse of scripture that's hard for people to believe. People love the book, of, they love to take verses out of the book of James. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, that kind of stuff. You can't believe a promise in the scripture if you're not willing to believe the part of the, of the promise that tells you who it's written to. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Now you look at that verse. Who does the verse say the book of James is written to? To the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Who is that? That's Israel. You look at 1 Peter chapter 1, it's written to the same bunch of people. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, scattered. Talking about Israel, he calls them in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Who is that? So he says, well, that's the priesthood of the believer today. It is. What nation? What nation today is a, pre, is a, is a, is a royal priesthood? None. That's a promise right down by that verse, Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. If you don't have it written down in your Bible yet, if you've been with us for the past studies, you got that verse written down. That's the nation Israel. A verse couldn't be any clearer. You'd have to be blind in one eye and couldn't see out of the other not to see that 1 Peter 2, verse 9 is the fulfillment of Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. It's the nation Israel. You know what's going on over here? The middle wall of petition is back up. You're not in the dispensation of grace. You're in the ages to come. And the reason it's that way is because God is bringing to fruition that which he spoke by the mouth of all the holy prophets to the nation Israel. Now you've got to understand something. If you don't recognize the distinctive ministry and message that our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven gave to the Apostle Paul and how that interrupted the prophetic program with, some, with this secret program that wasn't prophesied about, but now is made known, and how that when that end, ends, prophecy will be fulfilled. If you don't see that distinction, that interruption in prophecy, you're going to not be able to understand the things back there because 
you, when they talk about a kingdom and, 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 and so forth, these passages talk about a king, and they don't come, they don't come. The assumption then is, well, they weren't, re, they weren't literal, physical, visible, earthly promises, that they must have really been moral, righteous, spiritual promises, because that's what came in here. And therefore, you have the preterist, you have the covenant, you have the amillennial, the postman, all these goofball ideas out here that are predicated on the fact that God lied to Abraham, lied in the prophets. He didn't really mean the earth. He really didn't mean prophecy. Jesus really didn't mean, mean the meek shall inherit the earth. Because they didn't want to happen. But really, what really happened is that God meant everything he said, said everything he meant. He just interrupted it, and that isn't what's being done today. But these books demonstrate he will. The wisdom of God has put his word together so that it communicates to you God's wisdom, and your faith can rest in confidence in what God has said. We'll see you again next time. Maranatha. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again to the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. We're going to come to the conclusion in this, in this broadcast of a, of a lengthy study that we've been doing now. This will conclude seven hours of, of a journey through the Word of God in order to gain a strategic grasp of the scriptures. And when we started, I told you we weren't going to try to give you every detail of the Bible or even try to, to follow the storyline of the Bible per se in the sense of uh, uh, going through every book and so forth. There's a ministry called Walk Through the Bible that, that does a good job of that kind of thing. I want to give you the ability to grasp uh, an, a doctrinal understanding of God's Word so that you can understand the, the, the plot of the Scripture and the, over, the overview of it so that uh, you, you have an ability to understand where you are as you study it. That's, that's in essence what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he talks about rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Dispensational Bible study gives you the ability to get an overview of God's Word so you know where the pieces all fit together. Now we've been studying and looking at uh, this. I'm going to get the chalkboard out again. He, Paul, Paul in his uh, epistles, we've seen over and over now, that uh, he, he divides up the Bible into three sections. First, there, there's time past. And in time past, the basic characteristic of time past is a distinction between the circumcision, the nation Israel, and the uncircumcision, that's the Gentiles, that's everybody else beside Israel. Then you have a period of time called but now, which is where we are today in the dispensation of grace, where Israel, the fall of Israel has taken place and salvation has gone to the Gentiles, not through Israel, but without Israel. And then there's a time period that's called the ages to come. Now, if you've just joined us today and you haven't been with us in the past, uh, let me tell you that that's a, this, this time past but now and the ages to come it comes out of Ephesians chapter number 2. If you would like, I would be happy to send you even today in our last study, uh, our, our little Bible study booklet that goes along with uh, us, hundred, over a hundred page booklet that goes along with our uh, studies. Uh, in, in the, the, uh, uh, the past seven hours, a seven-hour journey through the Word of God. Uh, and, and this booklet will give you a handouts for each of the studies. If you haven't been with us and you'd like to have it, you call the number that you see there or write us here, and I'll be glad to see that you get a copy of it. It'll bring you up to date. There's a lot more information in the handouts than I can talk about in these short little studies. But I want you to follow what's going on here. Uh, time passed, but now, and then the ages to come, we go back and we fulfill the prophetic program. The basic distinction in your Bible is the distinction between prophecy, that which has been spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, and what Paul calls in here the, the, the secret, the mystery, that which has kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, has to do with forming the church of the body of Christ. This program back here has to do with what God's doing through the nation Israel. Now, the books of Genesis to Malachi fit back here, of course, but then the books of Matthew to John. The earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in time past. His ministry back here. He dies at the end of these, uh, of the, these books. He's, he's 
resurrected, he ascends into heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit back down here. And as the book of Acts begins here, you have the continuation of the ministry of Christ to the nation Israel. Then you have the fall of Israel, salvation going to the Gentiles, when Christ from heaven reveals to Saul, Paul of Tarsus saves Saul, makes him Paul the apostle, and gives us new revelation of some new information not previously revealed uh, to Paul. Paul writes that information down in the books of Romans through Philemon, which is where we are today. Now one day the dispensation of grace will be brought to a conclusion. Christ will come get us, take us back into the heavens to reign with him there. And then he will take up where he left off back here. The distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision will come into effect again. And you have the books of Hebrews through Revelation that will then fit in the ages to come. John the Baptist back here warned Israel about uh, fleeing from the wrath to come, fits right out here. He talks about him coming back here, the Son of Man coming. He talks about thy kingdom come, and he talks about these stages of prophecy being brought to fruition. And these books we saw last time fit specifically in the ages to come. Hebrews chapter 2 says specifically that what we're talking about, under which of the angels hath he put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. They're specifically written by God in a very, very unique, wise way back here to affect them from these people, to be doctrine for these people over here. The saints over here, after the dispensation of grace, in the tribulation, uh, going into the kingdom, they're going to have a 2,000 year delay in their program. They're going to need to be, have some explanation about what that is. Second Peter does exactly that. They're going to have the advanced revelations that Paul has given here about the cross work that isn't in information that isn't back here. They're going to have information that was, that was kept secret and nobody knew about. How does that relate and change what's going on with them, or does it? They're going to need to have some information that will do that for them. And these books do exactly that. Now, Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews 6. One of the things that rightly divide in the Word, you know, everybody's interested in themselves. Here's us. Here we are. Everybody wants, I want mine. All the promises in the book are mine. I, that's just so, so. If you can't get over being so selfish as to think everything in God's Word has to be about you, you need to go take a cold shower. Everything in God's Word, everything in God's Word is about God. So it says, well, God just wants me to be happy. What rock did they find you under, for heaven's sake? The issue isn't about you being happy. The issue is about you glorifying God, giving Him glory. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God, your happiness. Well, you don't even have sense enough to know what will make you happy two days from now. There's stuff right now you just think you've got to have or you're just going to die and you're going to be so miserable. You get it and then you think, what did I want this for? Now you know that. You're just that fickle. You need to get outside of yourself into something that never changes. How about God's Word? Everything in the Bible isn't about you. These people back here in time past, those people in the ages to come, they deserve instructions in God's Word that is about them as much as you do and deserve instructions about you. And don't you be a spiritual thief by stealing what God gave them and making out like He gave it to you. I mean, let's be honest about it, Buster. Lady, friend, dearly beloved, whoever you are, any of the above, none of the above. I mean, grow up. This is God's book. And it ain't all about you, but it is all about Him. And our joy is to find out what He's doing. And if you'll find out what He's doing, and then do that, you'll be doing the will of God. You find out what He's doing today is forming the body of Christ. Be a part of that. You'll be doing God's will in your life. Find out what He's doing in Hebrews Revelation. He's given instruction for the age to come, the little flock. But you've got to grow up to do that. You've got to quit being a little, well, I want it all for me. My grandson, two years old, his daddy taught him and says, what does the choo-choo say? Toot, toot. What does the piggy say? Oink, oink. What's the cow say? Meow. What's Noah say? Mine. What's daddy say? Stop. What's mama say? No. What's Noah say? Mine. You know what a two-year-old does? 
mine. I want that. I want that to be mine. I understand why it can't be mine. Well, grow up. Okay? I'm not trying to kick you around. I'm just trying to wake you up. <laughs> That's my last shot at you. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the first principles of, of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The first principles of the doctrine of Christ are laid down here. Christ said, I've got some more things to tell you that you can't bear now. I've got to wait till after the Spirit of God comes. And the Spirit, when He comes, He's going to guide you into all truth and show you things to come. Here they are over here. So let's go on to perfection. Perfection, maturity, grown up, move from being babies to, to adults, from milk to strong meat, which is what's discussed at the end of chapter 5 here in Hebrews, is found over here. Now, just like in Paul's epistles, we, we discovered a couple of weeks ago that there was a doctrinal edifice for the perfection of the saints in Paul's epistles and that it matched the thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3. While scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's proper for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Doctrine is what you believe. Correct, reproof is to show you what, 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 what's wrong. Correction is to show you how to fix it. That equates to instructions in righteousness. It's not enough to know what you ought to believe. You need to know when, when, what's wrong. You may, if you know what to believe, then it'll identify the mistakes. And when you find the mistakes, you need to know how to correct it. This is the practical instructions based on the doctrine. There's a doctrine. Here's the duty. Paul's epistles lays out doctrine, approved corrections, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. You, you remember that. Well, the Hebrew epistles lay themselves out in exactly that same doctrinal order. This is not the, the chronological order in which they were written, but it is the doctrinal order that matches the edification because here is the perfecting of the saints over there in that program. First, you have the book of Hebrews. Then you have the book of James. Then you have the book of 1 Peter. You have doctrine, reproof, correction. Then you have the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter is the next book of doctrine. Then you have the books of 1, 2, and 3 John. The epistles of John. Those are epistles of reproof. Then you have the book of Jude, which is a book of correction. Then you have the book of Revelation, which is the, the next great book of doctrine. After Revelation, there aren't any more books. Just like you had Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and then there aren't any more church epistles, epistles written to local churches. The same progress. Hebrews... The doctrine here is about the cross, just like Romans was about the cross. Now, Romans was an explanation of the cross and how the cross equips you and I to live on planet Earth as members of the body of Christ. It gives us our identity and equipping to live on planet Earth as a member of the body. The cross, the book of Hebrews, explains to the nation Israel what the cross is to them, and is accomplished for them, just like Romans explains what the cross has accomplished for us. Follow that? Then James gives practical instructions about the fruit of the the fruits of the kingdom that the cross is designed to produce in them. And First Peter, the ability to endure against the fiery darts and the fiery trials of their faith. So you have doctrine, reproof, correction. You have the 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 edification system that that's orients them first to the issue of God's grace and the ability of God's grace to motivate them to endure through this kingdom. Now the book of Hebrews, and I don't have time to go through all of these things, and again I would encourage you to write and get the the Bible study, hand, the handouts that we're giving you, it'll give you a lot of information to read and go along with what we're talking about. I'm just going to have to hit the high points here, just a couple of them. But the book of Hebrews is a book of transition back into Israel's program. Matthew, you have a transition. Uh, it says about John the Baptist, Luke 16, 16, The law and the prophets were until John. Since then the kingdom of God is preached, and all men press into it. 
There came a new opportunity of the nation Israel. They just had the law and the prophets, the promises, but now the opportunity is presented for them because the Messiah is, is there. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Matthew is a transition from that Old Testament into the offer of the kingdom. The book of Acts is the continuation of that offer. It's the fall of Israel and then the transition into the church, the body of Christ. The book of Hebrews you're going back from where we are today in the Israel's program, but you're not going to go back into the Old Testament. Hebrews says, don't go back. Go on to perfection. Don't go back to the Old Testament. Go on to the New Testament. Because the cross work is what has provided the replacement of the Old Testament with the New Testament. And it's going to reorient them. Hebrews chapter uh, 1 God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of, ma of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Based upon, the, uh, upon him purging our sins, Paul, uh, uh, Hebrews says, based upon what he did at Calvary, he is going to receive an, an inheritance out here, and that inheritance is going to have to do with, 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 with this name, this excellent name of being set as the head of all things in the earth. Verse number 8, he says, Unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He gets the kingdom, but it's all based upon the new covenant that he won through the blood of his cross and how he purged their sins and their conscience from, from, from sin and he provided for them. And they don't need to go back to the old system. You see in the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be calling them to go back to the temple and go back to the Old Testament sacrifices and go back to the old system that they, he, he'll restore Moses and the temple and all that. You know, hear people all the time talking about, well, they're going to rebuild the temple. It's the Antichrist is going to be rebuilding the temple. Jesus Christ is never going to rebuild the Mosaic system. The people that rebuild the Mosaic system with the Antichrist. The book of Hebrews says, don't fall for it. Don't go. We don't, we don't have an altar down here. It's done at the cross and did away with that. And the, all this old system. And Hebrews orients them to the grace of God provided for them through the cross and motivates them not to go back to the Mosaic system which the Antichrist seeks to rebuild in Israel. So Hebrews is going to be a foundation book for Israel. And when you come to chapter 13, he tells them in, in verse number 9, Be not carried away about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied thereby. Don't go back to the law to the ceremonies and the rites and the rituals, the meats. But go on to the gra grace. Grace, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Israel's grace, the, gra the spirit of grace and supplication that's going to get them into their kingdom is all based upon what Jesus Christ did for them in Calvary. You remember in Revelation 5 when they say he's worthy to have dominion, power, and honor? Why? Because he was slain. He's the lamb slain. Worthy is the lamb. Hebrews explains the cross and what, how it's, it's the basis of Israel receiving her kingdom to the nation Israel. Now then when you come to the book of James, you're going to get some issues about the, the fruits of the kingdom. That little flock that, 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 that is based on the grace of God, established in grace, what does it do? He said, Jesus told the Pharisees, I'll take the kingdom from you and give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. James is talking about the fruits, the lifestyle that's necessary to reflect their identity as the righteous nation that goes in to the kingdom. Isaiah 33, he asks them, he says, Who shall dwell among the everlasting burning? Who will make it through all of this? And then he gives them a, a, a set of 
descriptions of, of conduct that the book of James points to. Why? Doing it, why? Because they're identifying themselves as the real, true remnant, the believers, the doers of the word and not the hearers only. First Peter, the issue in First Peter is going to be the hope that endures through the fiery trials and the physical sufferings. And so you get, you get some correction about it isn't the things that you see, it's the things that your, your, your hope is in. Hope is your correct doctrine. We've got to go on. Second Peter. Second Peter, just like these books are about the cross, these books over here are about the congregation, about the church, and about the corruption, the corrupting of, of, of the little flock. Just like in these, these, this, this set of doctrines in Paul's epistles about the church, about that body of Christ and why God saves it, here it's, it's the satanic policy of evil aimed at destroying the little flock so that they're not going to be qualified to get into the kingdom and they need to be equipped with some doctrinal understanding that will get them through the tribulation, the enduring, and guard them so that they're not carried away. One of the things in this thing is he says in chapter 3 about Paul. He said, count that the long-suffering of, of, of God. Here's the explanation for why it's been 2,000 years. The scoffers say, oh, see, he forgot about us. He didn't really mean it. And Peter says, no, no, the reason for the delay is explained by the ministry of Paul. <laughs> he said there's some doctrine to guard against the corrupting of the little flock. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is reproof about that. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are a series of tests that are given so that you can identify the real true remnant. Revelation 2, he says, you've identified them that say they're Jews and are not. Well, how did they do that? They've got a series of tests in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Here's how you test. And you test the behavior to see if someone's born of God. Then in Jude, here is they're going to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. People are corrupting the doctrine. Then when you come over to Revelation, the issue over here is his coming, naturally. Now just like this back here orients Israel to God's grace, in here he's going to orient them to how to guard against the seductive policy of the, ad of the adversary, over here, he's going to demonstrate the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in that coming kingdom. When he comes with all his holy angels, when the Lord comes in his glory with all the holy angels with him, and he sits upon the throne of his glory. Come with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. You'll notice, interestingly enough, that the book of Revelation, when it ends, there's nothing else. In fact, there's a warning. Nothing else needs to be added. Now, Again, if you get the handout, you'll, uh, you'll have the verses on this. Every epistle, this is true of Paul's epistles as well as these epistles, but every epistle ends, Hebrews ends, with a statement that James hooks on to. James ends with a statement that 1 Peter hooks on to. 1 Peter hook, has, has a hook that 2 Peter uh, hooks on to. Each one of these epistles, at the end of it, has a doctrine, states a doctrine that the next epistle picks up on. When you get to the book of the Revelation and you get to the end of it, it specifically says there is no more. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the, out of, out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. He that testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It's over. The end is here. There's nothing else. It's done. If you go back to chapter 21, you'll see why he says that. 21 verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he said, it's finished. Redemption's work's done. You get to the end of the book of the Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ says, it's done. What I died to accomplish is now completed. And the glory that that cross is designed to produce is here. Now, for these tribulation believers, they're going to need an internal edification and motivation that allows, that equips them to endure through all of that all the way to the end and to the glory. Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 12, verse number 1, he says, Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, it's all going to be based on looking, on looking to him. Who for the joy that was set before him, there's the kingdom, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How did he endure the, th the cross to win the victory and to have the, the joy of that kingdom? He did it by putting into his mind a realm of understanding of what was being accomplished. He did it, this edification process that Christ had is to be there. There it is. Now, we've got to go. Seven hours we've been through the Word of God together. My prayer is that you'd get a grip on God's Word so that God's Word can get a grip on you. Our desire is to help you to understand the Word of God so that understanding it, you can believe it, and believing it, you'll see it work in you for God's glory. Nothing will ever be any more wonderful, nothing will ever be more powerful in your life than for you to have your faith resting on an intelligent understanding of God's Word, which allows that Word then to bring the power and love and grace of God into your life for His glory. Thanks for being with us on the journey. We'll see you next time. Fair enough. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. Took the blame, and then I cry, what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace, he did it all, oh praise him.